Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel we have Glucose Goddess. This video is entitled, You CAN BEAT DIABETES AND INSULIN RESISTANCE. INSULIN RESISTANCE. Simple hacks to reverse it now. Well, there's one in particular that I'm thinking of that is quite efficacious due to the fact that it completely omits and elides the underpinning etiology and cause of it, which is one thing, might I add. There's other exacerbators, but there's one cause. Episode 8 of 18. Not sure what the series is here, but anyway, my book, Contraindicated, is out now for Patreon viewers right now, and also, of course, the YouTube viewers, because this will be seen a week later for you. So, please buy that. The link is going to be in the description below and also in the comment sections for this week's videos and i hope you guys enjoy it i worked very very hard on that so with that being said let's jump directly into this video and the hacks that i'm sharing they don't ask you to cut out the carbs that you love this is so okay i already have a problem here there's already a f***ing problem here well, we got five seconds into the video, and there's a problem here. You should be cutting out things that are toxic to the human body, and also unnecessary. Really, vice versa. Unnecessary, and also toxic to the human physiological system, one of which is carbohydrates. All of them. The prototypical one is glucose. Glucose is a six-carbon aldehyde. It's an aldohexose. Really, an aldehyde is a functional group in chemistry that tends to bind onto lipid rafts and destroy them. Aldehydes and aldehyde functional groups in isolation have the tendency to do such things, so even if those functional groups are attached to more complex molecules, it still has that propensity and that ability and capability, really, to destroy cells, destroy lipid rafts, tear cell membranes to pieces, bind to DNA, and promote carcinogenesis by causing mutations to it as the underpinning etiology or the common denominator of all cancers, no matter the manifestation, is DNA damage or DNA distortion, and in a high enough concentration but still relatively low, kill cells outright, Jesse. You see, you're a biochemist, and I looked into your background. You are a biochemist. Unfortunately, that is not really taught in colloquial biochemistry classes, but it is the case, and it is a fact. We have the ability to create all of the glucose we need, the only essential carbohydrate, really, in terms of what needs to be made. Glucose can be isomerized into fructose when needed for the preservation of sperm cells within semen, for example, as one function of fructose in the body. Fructose is utilized in the brain as well, but glucose is the only compound that needs to be created endogenously, and we can create all of it, and have been doing so for millions of years, through non-glucose precursors, through gluconeogenesis in the liver, and also the kidneys, if needed, the small convoluted tubules, from odd-chain fatty acids, glycerol, and amino acids, catalyzed by the hormones glucagon, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. Those last three, very associated with stress, or really distress, but association does not mean that that is, in and of itself, the essence of those hormones. They play other roles as well. They are not necessarily indications of distress. If risen chronically, that's a different story. They are not bad hormones, though. For example, like I just said, they stimulate gluconeogenesis. Genesis. You should absolutely be cutting carbs, is basically what my point is. Sensibly, prudently, not impetuously and cursorily, over the course of six to eight weeks. I want to repeat it. They don't ask you to never eat sugar or pasta or bread again. They're just okay, well, I'm asking people to do that. I'm encouraging people to do that because those are insalubrious contraindicated compounds for human physiology, not only due to their carbohydrate content, but also due to their plant toxin content or anti-nutrient content, such as lectins, phytates, oxalates. Fiber itself, actually, is a contraindication in the human diet. We'll get to that later if it becomes salient or relevant. How about I quit talking, though, and let's find out you how to eat your carbs in a way that's also going to help pour your type 2 diabetes into remission. Diabetes is a disease characterized by chronically elevated blood glucose and nothing else. That is how it is measured and diagnosed. The only way to actually achieve a diabetic state is to be consuming carbohydrates to some degree or another. You can lower the threshold that one would have to attain or surpass or achieve in order to develop diabetes by eating seed oils and taking statin medications. Medications. But that is not ever going to be the cause of diabetes, really. Carbohydrates are required for the process of diabetes. So stop with this convoluted obfuscation of what diabetes and the solution and remediation to such a problem is. It is a carbohydrate consumption problem. It's not an insulin resistance problem. It's not an insulin regulation problem. It is a carbohydrate consumption problem, and it needs to stop, and people need to be encouraged to stop eating carbohydrates. End of discussion. What is this intro? Hello angels and welcome to the Glucose Goddess show. I'm Jospe, I'm a French biochemist and I'm here 
to teach you about to your body. In today's episode, we're going to cover insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is a construct and a concept. It's also vastly misunderstood in the medical community and the population at large that is even remotely health conscious. That is a symptom, not the etiology. People have it completely backwards. We'll get into that later type 2 diabetes. I'm going to break some myths. I'm going to give you tips to... Okay, no. I'm going to break the myths here. You are going to supplant the myths that in some cases may actually not be myths. We'll get to that later as well. With more myths. So we will eviscerate all of them. Like pulling the brick at the bottom of Jenga Tower. The edifice will crumble. Okay? Okay conditions easily and without too much pain or complication. I'm really excited to get started with this topic. So let's do it. Okay, first things first, type 2 diabetes is a global epidemic. The international- Yes, 70% of patients with prediabetes, I believe, are expected to develop diabetes within the next few years. Mm -hmm. And that was as of a few years ago. So if anything, it's gotten worse. Amongst dogs as well. I don't know, just decided to throw that in there gratuitously. Enjoy. Diabetes Federation, they publish numbers every year, and they have found that 537 million adults in the world are now living with type 2 diabetes and another 541 million are living with pre-diabetes. These numbers are getting worse every single year. So right now, 1 billion people in the world have either, either type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes. And as I'm going to explain, this is all linked to insulin resistance. No, it's not linked to insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is almost invariably a result of consuming a mixed meal of fat and carbohydrates together, which upregulates one's Randall cycle to a deleterious degree. I covered the Randall cycle a few weeks ago when reacting to John McDougall or McDougall, not even sure how to pronounce it. Basically, the Randall cycle is a biochemical mechanism that is designed to protect the cells of the body from further damage, particularly from glucose. What occurs is when a cell sequesters substance in the form of fat, glucose, or a mixture of both. If that cell becomes fully replete with that fat or that glucose or mixture of both fat and glucose, it will disallow any further entry of substrate into the cell. Now, if that actually occurs in every single cell of your body, which is most propitiously achieved by eating a mixed meal of fat and carbohydrates together due to the way carbohydrates affect your hormones, first of all, it raises your insulin, which therefore raises your appetite, it actively downregulates glucagon, and also has the propensity to increase and stimulate your dopamine receptors seven to eight times more than cocaine itself. All of these factors make it to where it's far easier to overeat on fat and protein when it's almost impossible to do so in isolation, unless you have something, once again, that is carbohydrate laden or sweet in any way. Basically, therefore, it's far more of an auspicious approach to upregulating your Randall cycle when eating a mixed meal of fat and carbohydrates together. That causes the disallowance of substrate or any further substrate into the cells of the body, therefore causing any more substrate that is consumed to pool in the blood. Fat, but also carbohydrates. Glucose in the blood causes glycation, something that you, Jesse, are very familiar with because you talk about it all the time. You refer to it analogously as the cooking of the body. Fair enough for an analogy. Glycation is the process by which a sugar molecule binds on to a protein within the body and makes it work improperly or not work at all. It can occur with your LDL particles, your albumin, your hemoglobin, which is what the HbA1c test tests for, the glycation from hemoglobin, particularly from glucose, Paul Saladino, not from fructose. And therefore, this upregulates de novo lipogenesis inflammation, et cetera, et cetera, okay? It's not that the insulin that is released from the exorbitant amount of glucose within the bloodstream is not able to get the glucose into it because of the cell's tinnitus to insulin or something, or its unawareness of the fact that insulin is outside of it, attempting to usher the substrate into the cells. It's due to the fact that the cell is purposely disallowing entry due to the fact that it doesn't want to die. Therefore, insulin resistance is a symptom of poor dietary input, particularly excess carbohydrate consumption. What is excess? More more than zero grams. End of discussion. Diabetes is chronically elevated blood glucose, nothing else. Not insulin resistance. We're done. Insulin resistance is not a pathology. It is an adaptive response to poor dietary input. It is exactly what our bodies are supposed to do given the stimuli that is stimulating that response. One way that it's caused is a Randall cycle upregulation to a deleterious degree. Another way that it's caused insulin resistance, this fallacious construct, really, at least misunderstood, is by also not eating carbohydrates because it downregulates the glute 
for transporters in the outsides of cell membranes, thus disallowing the body to handle a carbohydrate bolus as well, quote unquote, as someone else that eats them every day. I would be one of these people. The myth there is that that's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. That's a sign that you should stop eating carbohydrates and should never eat them again. Also, that regulates itself after the consumption of carbohydrates for about two to three days, typically. So even then, it's not really that big of a deal. Anyway, uh, Jesse, are we done? Basically, the cure for diabetes is the abstention of carbohydrates, the consumption of them. We're done here. No, I wish. We need to do something about this. This is Yeah, we do. Of the food environment we live in, we need more regulation in food supply, food companies. Okay, now we're entering the realm of politics, so let's be careful here. We need to be educated so we, that we can figure out how to navigate this difficult landscape that is causing these issues. You may have diabetes, you may know somebody who has diabetes, you may have insulin resistance, you may have already covered that. Diabetes or know somebody who does. This information is going to help you. The first thing you need to know is that these conditions are not genetic. Okay. Correct. Absolutely. Props to you for saying that because the immediate proclivity for people out of just a proclivity to justify their addiction, to say those things and to say that it is genetic is appalling. It's abysmal. It's asinine. Type 2 diabetes is not something that you are born with. It's not something that you cannot do anything about. It is something that is a consequence of the way you're eating and the way you're living. And it's not your fault, okay? The odds are stacked against you. All Sometimes it is your fault, but for the most part, yes. I talked about this last week. It's a lot of times not the people's fault, but okay. Accessible today is making our health worse and increasing this diabetes number worldwide. I'm going to give you information that's going to help you actually be able to navigate this complicated landscape. And how do we know that type 2 diabetes is not genetic? We have a few different proofs. First of all, type 2 diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes. It was called that way because only adults would get it. Well, today, five-year-old children are getting this condition. It's ridiculous. It's due to misanthropy. It's absolutely abysmal. Once again, it's ridiculous. That was not the case at all. And our genes have not changed so much. What has changed is what we're eating and the food environment. So that's clue number one. Clue number two, we know from scientific studies that identical twins, so people who have the exact same DNA to the letter. Phenotypically and genotypically identical, because that's important. Well, if one twin has type 2 diabetes, the other twin might not necessarily have it. It's right, okay. Really the way that we know is because our genes are not encoded to develop diabetes like that. We know that through biochemical means, which the irony is not lost with this one because you're a biochemist yourself. It's the same reason why we say obesity isn't genetic either. People have higher propensities to store onto fat, women more so than men. Once again, due to our genes, due to what they're encoded for, one sex has their genes tailored towards childbearing more than the other, for example. That's patent and demonstrable right there. But with respect to obesity as a status, even if you have a higher propensity to store onto fat given poor dietary input, it is still down to poor dietary input. It is not genetic that you will just become obese or that you will just be obese or overweight. Sorry, we know this. Like both twins always have it or both twins always don't have it. It is due to other factors. So that's another really important clue that one identical twin can have type 2 diabetes and the other one cannot have it. That is not 100% genetic. And finally, and I think for me, the most compelling piece of evidence is that Hundreds of studies have shown us that if we change the way that we eat, we can put our type 2 diabetes into remission. Well, once again, the studies that you're about to cite are probably from human nutrition science, which is the science, it's theology, because if you can't employ complete control over your subjects, then it's not science. It is by definition theology. It is theory generating. Okay, biochemistry is hard science. We can derive that from there. The reason why I'm being like this is not to aggrandize myself above everyone else in a sanctimonious, narcissistic fashion, like I'm the one that's always right, even within my own crowd. No, it's, it has nothing to do with that. It's the fact that in order to justify your position on something within the health sphere, you you need to base it upon science. That's important. When we base it upon theology, you're no better than a vegan because they base their science or their beliefs rather on this health science. If the vegan is arguing for veganism for health reasons, usually it's for religious reasons though, and that's a different story. But the entire methodology needs to change. So even if your conclusion is right, if the way in which you derive that conclusion is completely errant and fallacious, it needs to still be chastised in a way. Just because you get the right answer on a math question, if you did all your work wrong, you didn't learn anything. It's basically what I'm saying. Now, this is the key. If you've been diagnosed with diabetes, your only option is not to take medication for the rest of your life. 
if you're willing and if you're able to change how you're eating, you can put this condition into remission. Now, I know that for a lot of people, it's really hard to fathom changing how we're eating and our food habits, and it seems like something that is way too complicated and out of reach. Addiction. Marie, the stuff I'm gonna share with you today is actually simple, and you'll be able to do it. It's not a complicated diet. It's not super restrictive. It doesn't ask you to buy $35 smoothies. We're here for practical. Well, that would be insalubrious and counterproductive for ameliorating diabetes in the first place. I already covered the solution in the beginning. Let's see if she gets any of it right and says something that's at least slightly congruous. Easy tips. But first, before we get into all of the ways to solve it, I want to give you guys a little biology recap, biology one-on-one, -on, -one, on what is insulin resistance. Well, I covered that. Let's see if you get any of this f***ing correct. What is type 2 diabetes? The most important thing to remember that I think probably you might not know yet is that insulin resistance is a spectrum. And so it's a construct. It's based upon proxy measures. You can't buy an insulin resistance meter and measure your insulin resistance. It's a construct based upon proxy measures, particularly fasting insulin and fasting blood glucose. And I already explained what is the cause of this, but even then we shouldn't be talking about the cause. It's a symptom in and of itself. Rewind the video if you didn't quite understand or refer to the John McDougall or Duggal video that I reacted to just a few weeks ago because that sums it up quite well as well. It's a Randall cycle breakdown. It's in the title measure how insulin resistant anybody is at any moment. You can measure me, you can measure yourself, you can measure your mom, your sister, your friend, your colleague. You can measure insulin resistance. No, you f***ing can't, Jesse. How do you measure insulin resistance? Do you have an insulin resistance meter at home? Is there one sold in stores? No, you can't. You can measure fasting insulin and fasting blood glucose. You can also just measure non-fasting blood glucose or non-fasting insulin. It doesn't matter. You can measure insulin and blood glucose in different contexts. You can't measure insulin resistance. That is a diagnosis predicated upon proxy measure. And it is also, as a concept, a symptom. A symptom of what? Carbohydrate consumption. Given moment. When you're not insulin resistant, you're called healthy. When you get. What? You're called healthy if you exhibit an absence of disease process, typically. Insulin resistance is not pathology. So once again, fallacious. I am physiologically insulin resistant right now as we speak as a concept and a construct if we're utilizing it. I am. That's not pathological. Give me one reason as to why that's pathological and therefore makes me unhealthy. Insulin resistant. You're called pre-diabetic. And when you No, you're pre-diabetic if your A1C attains a certain threshold. The A1C being a measurement of your glycated hemoglobin as an average level over the span of around two to four months. That threshold being set by the misanthropic, rapacious, cupidinous medical establishment. Okay? They don't measure insulin resistance, Jesse. Completely erroneous here. Misleading. Really insulin resistant, then you're called type two. Diabetic. Thing. No, when you're highly glycated, as inferred from your A1C level, you're considered diabetic. That threshold being way too high. The bar is being set way too high, okay? I think it's about 6.5%. That is exorbitant. That is enormous, okay? It should really be probably about 5.8, 5.9, maybe 6.0% to provide maximal forgiveness here, but dangerous. Have type 2 diabetes. So insulin resistance and its spectrum is what underpins whether or not you have a diagnosis like prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. False. Cover that. If you've been diagnosed with insulin resistance, well, that means that you're somewhere in that spectrum. Maybe you're getting a little bit close to prediabetes. So insulin resistance moves. No, this is inferred by your A1C level and your glucose level at a fasting level in a fasting context. Where the hell did you get this from? become more or less insulin resistant depending on how you're living. And the, the objective is going to be to become less of it. So No, that's not the objective, Jesse. Because if you're talking about physiological insulin resistance as a construct, also known as peripheral insulin resistance, that's what I am. Really, I say that I would predict such a thing because I know the physiology and the consequences of certain actions like abstaining from carbohydrates. Okay, one of which is the downregulation of GLUT4 transporters in the outside of cell membranes. Those transporters being involved in the administration or the allowing of the cell sequestration by the cell of glucose from the bloodstream after the consumption of it. Guess what? Since I don't eat carbohydrates, my cells, when they divide, produce much less of those, therefore disallowing the body to oxidize as much of that substrate if I ate it, and instead converting more of it to fat or urinating it out, actually, through the kidneys. Well, through the urethra, but...
pedantic. So once again, the complete myth that insulin resistance is necessarily pathological, and actually even in the pathological insulin resistant model or insulin resistance model, it's not pathological in that situation either and in that scenario. It is exactly what your body is supposed to do given the stimuli that it is experiencing and that are being imposed upon the body, okay? We have to get this language out of the way. When your body is sick and experiencing a viral infection or is being invaded by a virus, your body in many cases launches a fever. The fever Fever is the symptom. So why do we have anti-fever medications in stores? It is what your body is designed to do given the circumstances. There is no evidence of insulin itself actually being damaging even in high concentrations within the blood. It's glucose that effectuates and induces the damage that the tissues incur and sustain. We're done. I wish even more. What the heck is insulin? Why do we care? What is this insulin resistance thing? Insulin is an anabolic hormone. Anabolic meaning building up and storing things. It's involved in muscle synthesis by the effectuation of IGF-1, IGF-2, and mTOR. Also the effectuation of glycogenesis, the storing of glucose within the muscles for later use. But it is also important for fat storing and fat creation as well via lipogenesis. And also the storing of fat that's already within the blood. Or, as I alluded to earlier, the transmutation of glucose into fat if it is found in excess in the bloodstream. How is it found in excess? If you fucking eat it. Okay? It's also important for ushering glucose in cells. I've already said all this. So there's insulin right there. That's what insulin is. Okay, so first, first things first. Before we talk about insulin, we have to talk about glucose. Don't worry, it's going to be easy. Glucose is the prototypical sugar. It's the carbohydrate that the body creates on its own endogenously. Later on, it can be isomerized into fructose, meaning that it takes the same constituents that the molecule is already made of and just switches them around in different orders. So it's made up of the same compounds, just in different orders. Fructose and glucose, those are examples of isomers. So glucose is a six carbon aldehyde and is an absolute toxin, biochemically speaking. Take the biochemical definition. It's a toxin, exogenous glucose particularly. Endogenously created glucose is not a toxin. Glucose is required for survival. If there were no glucose pumping through my blood right now, I would be dead. By the very manner of me sitting upright in this chair and me talking to you, Jesse, and saying, I can't believe what you're saying right now because it's completely incorrect. There are muscles firing and twitching that require glucose to be able to do such things. But guess what? I didn't need it. And neither should you or anyone else, especially if they have diabetes or are trying to prevent the development of such a disease. A very painful disease, by the way. A lot of people may think that it's not painful. I mean, people get their legs cut off because of this, and their flesh rots away beforehand. Okay, it's not pretty. Glucose is your body's favorite source of energy. False, Jesse. Absolutely erroneous, fallacious demagoguery. Ridiculous nonsense. For four and a half million years of our existence, if you include proto-humans that preceded our current speciation, that being Homo sapiens sapiens, we have subsisted, not really subsisted, we have depended on fat for our primary energy Fuel is the correct term. Source entirely. Completely bereft and destitute of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates destroy the cells of the body, exogenously speaking. It is not our favorite source of energy. The only reason why scientists came to that conclusion, there are two reasons in particular. The first being that by the time we developed the technology to actually assess what the human body primarily was oxidizing for energy, we were already consuming glucose. The second reason is because when you consume fat and carbohydrates together, your body typically oxidizes that glucose first. Precisely due to its toxicity, however, not its desire or its preference to glucose. Complete misinterpretation. It is not the body's favorite source of energy. Incorrect. False. Fat is more versatile. It results in more ATP production. It is a shorter process within the body. It does not damage your cells whenever it is kept inside cells as opposed to glucose. I can go on and on about this. A 16 carbon chain fatty acid results in 339% more ATP production than a glucose molecule. 120 ATP versus 38 net ATP from glucose. If you take all of the NADHs and pyruvate that are yielded from glycolysis as well and convert them into ATP. <sighs> Gosh, where were we getting glucose from four and a half million years ago, Jesse? Did you ever think about that? We had it during one ephemeral transient time of the year, that being fruit season. And fruit then is nowhere close or near to what fruit is now. And also it was precisely to allow us to gain fat for the upcoming winter. So this is ridiculous. This is nonsense. It needs to stop being said. It needs to stop being promulgated and perpetuated within the health sphere and also within biochemistry classes. It's ridiculous. There is no evidence of this claim being true anywhere.
Okay, every single part of your body, like my fingers that I'm moving right now, my mouth that I'm using to speak to you, your brain as you're listening to me, they're all burning glucose for energy. They're not burning anything. Your body doesn't burn anything, Jesse. It oxidizes things. It reacts chemicals under control of molecular oxygen. That's what happens, okay? But also my cells are oxidizing fat as well. So what's your point? It's the most important fuel in your body. And the way no, it's not. Hey, Jesse, how do I have glucose running through my veins right now if I didn't need it? Oh, yeah, your body creates glucose through odd chain fatty acids, amino acids, which are constituents of protein, and also glycerol from triglycerides. So still relating to fat. This is, <laughs> anyway, trite, banal, insipid. That you give glucose to your body so that you can have energy. No, you give fat to your body so it can oxidize it or really transmute it into glucose if necessary, and you give it protein as well, because that is the species-appropriate, species-specific diet for human beings. Or really, those are the constituents of it. It really is that simple. This was established unambiguously and unequivocally in 2019 and further in 2021, okay? We know what we're supposed to eat as a species. Every single species on the face of this planet has one diet for its species. We are no different in that respect, okay? And that diet is bereft and destitute of carbohydrates. We're done. And the way that you give glucose to your body so that you can have energy is by eating foods. Yes, but it doesn't mean eating glucose directly. Okay, we're done here. You're a biochemist, you should understand this. Specifically, by eating two types of foods. By eating starches. No, false, fat, and protein. Gluconeogenesis, Jesse. By the way, starches are composed of just glucose, just straight glucose, which if you're going to rank the carbohydrates in terms of their deleterious nature, glucose would be at the bottom in terms of its severity or its deleterious nature. It's the most benign and innocuous. It is not benign or innocuous at all, but it is the most benign and innocuous out of the sugars, disaccharides or monosaccharides. If you're wondering what the worst is, that's fructose. That's bread pasta, rice, potatoes, oats, and by eating- Okay, so those are insalubrious and contraindicated for human physiology. They have anti-nutrients within them. They're all made from plants. If you look at them, you can infer that. They're all made from plants. Plants are not food for human beings and they never have been. We have been eating plants in any significant amount, really, for 13,000 years as an overestimate, which is when the agrarian revolution occurred. We've existed as a species, if you include proto-humans that preceded our current speciation, for four and a half million years. What is 13,000 divided by four and a half million converted into a percentage? It's less than 1%. Plants contain poisons. Plants are poisonous. We have made the erroneous assumption that just because some plants, after human hybridization to make them less poisonous and toxic, don't kill us immediately upon consumption, that somehow they're completely safe. And that is false. And that has been one of the banes and scourges of our existence. Okay? Phytates, oxalates, polyphenols, even. Lectins. Lectins are teeming in all of those foods right there, actually. Every single one of them. Potatoes. Solanum tuberosum. That's a lectin. Found in potatoes. Bread? Pasta? What about gluten? Gluten's a lectin. And constitute 70 to 80 percent of the protein found within wheat. It's just nonsense, Jesse. No one should be eating these foods because they're not food for human beings, and they never have been, and they never will be. Okay? The flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals primarily is what we should be eating. Sugars. By sugars. There's no difference between those. What you just laid out. Starches are sugars. End of discussion. They break down to the same f***ing things. Anything that tastes sweet. From an app That's not exactly the case, because glucose isn't particularly sweet in isolation. Fructose is, but not glucose, so... Oh, man. Obfuscation. This is bread and circuses. To a slice of chocolate cake. So when we eat these starches or these sugars, and they go into our mouth, they then break down into glucose. Yes, usually within the mouth, before they even reach the stomach. It's one of the reasons why when you eat bread, it starts to taste sweet before you even swallow it contain glucose. So when you eat starches or sugars, they're going to increase your glucose levels in your- Yep, and that's exactly why you shouldn't eat them. Well, that's one of the main reasons why. There you go. Damaging. Not supposed to happen. Your blood glucose is supposed to rise to a certain degree postprandially, in other words, after you eat, in order to effectuate processes within the body that are only able to be effectuated within anabolic situations, okay? You get a completely sufficient insulin rise or bump in insulin as a result of a bump in glucose as a result of eating the proper human food, that being the flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals primarily. Eggs are fine saturated fats in the forms of butter, tallow, lard, suet, and ghee, the stuff solid at room temperature. If you eat enough of that food, you will create glucose, okay? Sufficient amounts and adequate amounts. So you should not ever spike your glucose, not indicated. And after a meal, if you ate a lot of those foods, and by the way, those foods are called carbs, generally, starches and sugars are called carbs. If during a meal, you eat a lot of carbs, then you're gonna experience what's called a glucose 
spike. Yes, insalubrious, contraindicated, damaging, deleterious, not supposed to happen ever. They happened very seldomly in our ancestral past, despite what charlatans and miscreants like Paul Saladino would have you believe. Just a quick delivery of glucose to your body. And you could actually see this if you were measuring your blood. You would see like a big spike, like the one on this graph right here. So glucose spikes are a problem. They make us tired, they make us have cravings. It's the hypoglycemic proceeding that does such a thing. It's the glucose trough that causes things like that, yes. Yeah, after you spike your glucose, your body releases and secretes an exorbitant level of insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas. In many cases, in excess, it's a way that your body overreacts. This can happen with your immune system. People have that happen in sepsis. That's a macro level of what I'm talking about, of course. This isn't as dangerous, but it's a very similar phenomenon on a micro scale. Your body releases an exorbitant level of insulin, and then it ushers too much glucose out of the bloodstream, leading to a hypoglycemic state, hypoglycemia increasing appetite, causing fatigue, in some cases shakiness, thus enticing you to eat more. And then goes the spike and dip phenomenon multiple times every single day. What does that lead to? Oh yeah, diabetes. Okay. Aim our body. And most importantly for our conversation today, they lead to your body sending out insulin. Why does your body respond to glucose spikes with insulin? Because, because of the fact that glucose is a water-soluble solute and therefore needs to actually have a facilitator to enter the cell. That facilitator is insulin. Fat can enter your cells with no hormones at all through passive diffusion. Body knows that big glucose spikes are not good for it. And so it calls- well, There you go. Well, what's the most auspicious approach to actually achieving a glucose spike? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Eating carbs. Pancreas, and it's like, Hey, pancreas, can you please send out some insulin to get that glucose spike down? So insulin arrives and grabs all the excess glucose. Excess being more than zero grams, exogenously speaking. In terms of excess of the bloodstream, it's really above four grams, typically. You have about four grams of glucose flowing through your blood at all times, homeostatically, if you are a healthy individual. Really, I say healthy. A more accurate term would be a physiologically optimal system, if you're functioning in an indicated fashion, physiologically. There you go. Four grams of glucose within the bloodstream, so. It stores it away in your liver, in your muscles, and in your fat cells. So you might be wondering, well, well, it stores fat into your fat cells. It transmutes glucose into fat, if that's what you meant. Is it possible that if glucose is the energy of my body, how is it possible that- It is not the energy of the body. False. There are multiple sources of energy for the body, and depending on what your demands are and what they call for, it will use glucose or it will use fat or amino acids. Typically, your body doesn't use amino acids for fuel, though. Those are building blocks, but it can do so. Usually, that's in cases of starvation or in protein excess. It'll oxidize into glucose. Good luck trying to eat enough protein to effectuate the process, though, if you are eating no carbohydrates or anything sweet to speak of. As you guys should know by now, no supplements need to be taken on a carnivore diet as you can derive everything you need from such a diet. However, this does not mean there aren't certain nutraceuticals that can be taken to further ameliorate inflammation and subsequently any illness, disorder, and disease one may be plagued with. One of the best products on the market, if not the best product in doing such a thing, is the flagship product to a company known as Cerule called Stem Enhance Ultra, which effectuates the release of one's own inherent stem cells from their bone marrow. When this occurs, this results in what may be perceived by some to be the epitome of regeneration. Now, I cannot under any circumstances claim any cause and effect relationships from this product and any hard health outcomes. However, one may speculate what they wish with this information. If you want to know more about this product or are interested in buying this product, as well as many other products from the Cerule company, please refer to the link on the screen now or the description below. How is it possible that I could give my body too much of it? Because it's very similar to testosterone, where your body creates just enough that it actually is adequate and sufficient, but if you inject too much of it exogenously, that is extremely damaging to the heart. Just because your body creates it endogenously does not mean that we should be eating it exogenously and it's totally benign to do such a thing, no matter the quantity. Okay? Glucose is toxic, exogenously speaking. I already explained why. Fructose is 7 to 10 times more glycating than that of glucose. That's even worse. That's the fruit sugar. That's what makes things so sweet. Sugar is sugar is sugar. Doesn't matter if it's white table sugar or if it's from a juicy orange, Peter Atia. Well, it's a bit like a plant. So, this plant on my desk right here, I know that it needs some water to live and survive. But, if I give the plant too much water, then it's going to drown and die. And okay, that is a similar analogy. However, the plant still needs water externally introduced. The difference here is that carbohydrates do not need to be externally introduced into the physiological system of a human being. So actually, it is not entirely analogous or congruous, but we see your point. It is the same. Some glucose, and it's really happy. But too much glucose, 
and problems start happening. If you mean some glucose, as in some exogenous glucose, no, not indicated. And so not happy if you're gonna personify the body. Notably, these glucose spikes. So after a meal, you eat lots of carbs, big glucose spike. Shouldn't do that. It's in your body. Insulin comes in, grabs all the excess glucose and stores it away into your cells. Okay, another point to add is that that's only with cells that have GLUT4 transporters on the outsides of them. What about GLUT1, 2, and 3 transporters? They're not insulin dependent. Like the cells of the kidneys, the liver, they sequester a lot of that glucose and sustain a lot of damage. They incur a lot of damage from that. So. So far so good? Okay. Now let me tell you a little story about when I was a student, because I have to explain this next part. So, I grew up not drinking any coffee. And then I moved to London and I was studying mathematics and I had my very first coffee. And let me tell you, that very first coffee of my life, it kept me awake for a very long time. I had a super hard time going to bed that night. I was wired. It was crazy. Now, I started getting used to drinking coffee and then three months later, I needed like three cups of coffee a day just to stay awake. And I wondered, What's going on? How is it possible that just a few months ago, one cup of coffee was keeping me awake for days, basically, and now I need three cups just to wake up in the morning and go to class? Acclamation. What happened was that my body got used to the coffee. My body gradually became resistant to... Not exactly. <laughs> I know what you're going to say here. This is not actually congruous or analogous to glucose consumption. Not even close. What happens is you eat glucose every day from the time that you're developing to the time into adulthood. You eat it every day, multiple times a day. Spike, dip, spike, dip, spike, dip. Okay, the optimal thing to have occur when you consume carbohydrates is that phenomenon. You want the spike, but then you want it to be proceeded by a trough. But if you do that every single day of your life for years and years and years on end and you sustain damage your cells sustain damage and they continue to divide and divide and divide as a result of that as your body starts to age it slows down and the more that it sustains damage regularly it slows down faster to the point where yes eventually it has a much more difficult time withstanding that damage those spikes don't start to be immediately preceded by troughs it takes a little longer for that trough to occur therefore your elevated glucose level is elevated for longer amounts of time when they're elevated that is really damaging that's when the damage really occurs, the maximum damage. This is what ends up leading to diabetes because then you've got chronically elevated blood glucose. It's trying to withstand the load, the induction, and it does so for decades. The onerous, arduous task of withstanding that damage and repairing itself and remediating itself until it can't any longer. If you're a biochemist, you probably know about telomeres as well. That has a role to play, I believe, in this, in the slowing down of the body. The body doesn't become resistant to insulin. That is false. There's no evidence of that, Jesse. So I needed to give my body more and more coffee to get the same effect. Well, with insulin, the same thing happens. False. You can say it alacritously and, and genially and, and all that stuff and buoyantly. It doesn't make it right. It makes it more beguiling and enticing to people that don't know any better, but it doesn't make it true. When there's lots of insulin in your body for a long time, your body slowly becomes resistant false. It knows the insulin is outside the cell. The cells are purposely disallowing entry of that substrate, particularly glucose that insulin is trying to usher into those cells precisely to mitigate and prevent the damage that would occur if that substrate were sequestered. This philosophy is dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because this is the underpinning philosophy and reasoning as to why metformin is a drug in the first place. Metformin is a diabetic drug that forces the cells to open the doors to the substrate, killing the cells. It looks like a win on your blood glucose number because the blood glucose level goes down. Your cells are incurring major damage though, specifically very precious cells to the body. Dangerous information here, misinformation. From a biochemist, people, amazing. Insulin, just like with the coffee. False. More and more insulin to do the same thing. And in this case... Your body continues to release insulin because it's believing that insulin's not doing its job when in reality that's not the case. Randall cycle, typically. But also, in many cases, a toxification or a toxifying of the cells from things like seed oils and also statin medications, which once again, I say medications very sardonically because it's not a medication. It needs more and more insulin to grab that glucose and store it away in your cells. Mm, but it won't store it into the cells. We just covered this. If you're talking about insulin resistance, then it's not gonna usher them into the cells. This seems a little paradoxical, it seems a little contradictory. 
So your body starts producing more insulin. But just like with coffee, if you start drinking more and more coffee, you're going to become more and more resistant to it and you're going to need more and more of it. It's kind of a vicious cycle. No, that's acclimation. That's a different phenomenon. They present similarly, but they're not the same thing. Your body, it's the same thing. Over time... No. Maybe a few months or years later, you're going to need so much more insulin to get that glucose out of circulation and into your cells. Your body will have become... But most of the time, it won't be sequestered, or administered rather, into the cells. It'll be stored as fat, be transmuted into fat, particularly palmitic acid, thus to be stored. We just talked about this, though. Resistant to the insulin. Construct, concept, and a fallacious one. We're done. That is insulin resistance. No, I already explained what insulin resistance was at the beginning of this episode here. Please rewind if you need to or would like to hear the explanation again. A nutshell. Now, what's the consequence? So let's say you keep eating- The consequence of eating carbohydrates is insulin resistance as a construct or concept. Once again, you're going to get it backwards here. You've been eating. So you're eating carbs and they're increasing your glucose levels. You're Contraindicated. There's your issue right there. And you're giving too much glucose to your body, but maybe- Okay, but too much is anything more than zero. Cover that. Well, after a while, because of this insulin resistance, cover that. Insulin is just not working very well anymore. No, the cells are purposely disallowing entry of substrate from insulin's ushering of that substrate into those cells, or its attempt to do so. Cover that. Not able to grab all the excess glucose and store it away. It is not able to do it, but that's not the fault of insulin. It's the fault, but it's not really the fault because fault means that it's doing it for an unreasonable, counterproductive reason. It's due to the cells disallowing entry. Cover that. So. Your glucose levels in your blood, they start to rise because the excess glucose is not being disposed of as easily as before. Your glucose levels in your blood start to rise and start to increase. Notice how that won't happen if you're depending on gluconeogenesis because it's a demand-driven process and only creates glucose in the exact required amount as is needed by the body at that given instance in time. Pretty amazing, huh? Because glucose in excess is toxic. Wow. And that is what is measured at the doctor's office. Earlier you said it was insulin resistance that was measured, Jesse. Which is it? Is the glucose measured? Yes. Is the glucose measured or is it insulin resistance? Because you can't measure insulin resistance. You said that you could in the beginning though, which was false. You've contradicted yourself again. Yes, it's glucose that's measured. It's your A1C in glucose. The only way to have elevated blood glucose is by eating f***ing glucose. They're required for the process once a year. Your doctor measures what's called your fasting glucose level. Basically, it mm -hmm. tells you to come into the doctor's office first thing in the morning and, it, and the doctor measures the amount of glucose in your blood. Now, if you're eating in a way that's not causing too many glucose spikes, you don't like eating the species appropriate species specific diet for our species, that being 100% carnivore, of insulin in the body, you're not very insulin resistant. Your construct. Stop using that term. Dose is going to be normal, healthy. It's going to be like 85 or 90. But if you've been eating in a way or lower, actually, that causes glucose spikes for a long time, therefore there's a lot of insulin in your body. Therefore, your insulin resistance. False. <laughs> Goodness me. I'm about to stop the video soon because this is just going to get trite. We're going to be beating a dead horse here or glucose is rising, your doctor might notice that your fasting glucose level is high. And here are the ranges that your doctor's going to look at. Your doctor's going to look at the number. So if your fasting glucose number is underneath 100, your doctor's going to tell you you're healthy, you don't have prediabetes, you don't have diabetes. If your fasting glucose number is between 100 and 126, your doctor's going to say, Oh, you're pre-diabetic. And if you're fast- mm, no. No, not exactly. <laughs> Maybe at the 126 milligram per deciliter range. 100? And I'm the last person to encourage higher blood sugar levels, but I, I'm just being realistic here. 100? That's pre-diabetic? Mm. ...level is above 126, your doctor is going to say, you have type 2 diabetes. Pretty sure it's about 139, 140 milligram per deciliter. I'm not sure what she's referring to. And this is just a way of explaining how insulin resistant you are. No, it's not, Jesse. We covered this. Rewind my video. If you have high 
glucose level, you also have a lot of insulin resistance in your body. They go No, because insulin resistance implies that the cells have some sort of tinnitus to insulin. They're purposely disallowing entry of substrate into them to protect them from damage. Over time, the cells do that for longer, thus causing the body to release even more insulin. It's not insulin resistance, that's a symptom. Hand in hand. In some countries, uh, that number uses a different unit, the fasting glucose number. Yeah, millimoles per liter. Instead of using milligrams per deciliter, you might be using millimoles per liter. And if you're using millimoles per liter, you want your fasting glucose level to be underneath 5.5 to be normal. It's just a unit thing. It's like uh, kilos and pounds, but it's the same concept. Now, why does it actually matter? if you have a lot of fasting glucose level. What? Because glucose glycates bodily tissues. We covered this, and we covered what glycation is. It's different from glycosylation or glycosylation, which is the enzymatic binding of glucose to other compounds and other tissues. It's enzymatically done, which means that the body's doing it on purpose. That's not damaging. Glycation is unsolicited. Is type 2 diabetes an issue? What's really going on? Let me take you on a little trip. Let's go see. I have sugar cubes here to show you guys. So what's really interesting is that in the body of a person who has normal fasting glucose levels, so healthy, this is the amount of sugar, of glucose, circulating in their body. It's just- I believe so. If that's four grams, I believe that's probably a four gram cube. One sugar cube. It's really not that much. Now, really, it's an interval, though. If anything, I think the interval would probably be one gram to four grams. Just depends on what your sugar needs are at that time. Somebody has type 2 diabetes. Do you know how much sugar they have circulating in their bloodstream? <laughs> one sugar cube and a half. The difference is tiny between a healthy person and someone with type 2 diabetes. This seems like no, no big difference, right? This seems like, okay, well, it's just a tiny, tiny increase in how much glucose is circulating in your body between being healthy and having type 2 diabetes. But the thing is, this has huge consequences. That tiny little increase in how much glucose is circulating is gonna hurt your cells, it's gonna inflame your body, it's gonna hurt your brain, it's gonna create glycation, it's gonna cause a whole bunch of issues. You know, an easy way of fixing that is by not eating it in the first place. Long term, if you've had type 2 diabetes for a long time, this can also lead to things like amputation. I mean, this is a serious condition and we wanna get that amount of glucose in your blood down so that you don't suffer the consequences. So, that was the recap. Insulin resistance is a spectrum. If you have insulin resistance is a concept, not a spectrum. We're done. Prediabetes or type two diabetes. That means your insulin resistance is not great, and it's it's pretty bad. No, it means your carbohydrate consumption isn't great, and it's in excess. Unequivocally, without question, it has to be the case necessarily. Okay, your cells don't sustain damage from insulin. It is not pathological. <sighs> no, most doctors still run just the fasting glucose test, but actually a better test is- Fasting insulin? Perhaps. But fasting glucose still gives you a good idea. Fasting insulin level. That is- There it is. Give you a sense of your insulin resistance. Because insulin levels they start rising for years before your glucose levels rise. So if you want to detect insulin resistance- Great, which is why it can be useful, because it can portend a developing problem before it actually becomes damaging. But we can completely eliminate this issue by not eating carbohydrates in the first place. Diabetes earlier, measure your fasting insulin levels. In the description of this episode, I have a one pager that recaps all these ranges, all these tests that you can run, etc. So that if you want to have this all in one page and show your doctor, you can. So have a look at the link in the description of this episode. Now, if you have insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes, you might also have other things that are related to all of this, like polycystic ovarian syndrome or fatty liver disease. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is basically type 4 diabetes. Fatty liver disease? Yeah. So what do you do if you have these conditions? Well, as I explained, it's all because there's too much insulin in your body. So False, Jesse. It's because you have too much glucose in your body. Insulin is the catalyst for the transmutation of carbohydrates into fat, causing fatty liver if it's in excess. But the insulin isn't what is causing the damage. It's the glucose. How can you have excessive insulin in the body without excessive glucose?
me. You're sitting here telling us about the damage of glucose, but then acting like insulin is the enemy here. Get that insulin down so that we get, get the glucose down. Glucose stimulates insulin. That fasting glucose level down. We need to give less glucose to our body, essentially. Absolutely. You need to give it zero grams. Is that realistic? No, I had about 10 grams this morning, but get it low, low. Jesse, even a gram of carbohydrate is still contraindicated in the human diet. Those 10 grams I ate this morning, contraindicated. <sighs> body doesn't need all this insulin and can slowly reduce how much it's producing. So how do we give our body less glucose? Well, listen. You don't eat it. What the, what the f kind of question is that? What kind of question was that? The most important place to start is to look at these carbs because the carbs are what turn to glucose as we digest them. So at least she gets that right. Goodness me. I mean, there are people saying that it's not similar at all to table sugar. They're all the same. They all break down to the same thing. The types of sugar contained within them and the ratio of them, those are different, but. How you're eating. Are you eating mostly starches and sugars? Are you eating mostly bread, pasta, pizza, sodas, granolas, fruit juices, candy? If that- Notice how they're all plants. Do you notice how every single thing she listed were plants? There's your sign right there. Where do carbohydrates come from? Plants. The only animal product they come from is certain dairy products, which is another reason why dairy itself, I hate to say it, is technically a contraindication in the human diet. You're giving a lot of glucose to your body all the time. There's another free thing in the description of this episode. I have lots of stuff I'm gonna give you. It's a big table that recaps what are starches, what are sugars, those increase your glucose levels, and then what are proteins, fats, and fibers, and those do not increase your glucose. Well, that last one's contraindicated. Also, fiber technically is a carbohydrate because it's a long chain of them. It's just not readily broken down into glucose in the bloodstream. It ferments into gluconeogenic precursors, acetate, lactate, and those are the ones that you want to eat more of and eat less. Absolutely not. You do not want to eat fibers. Proteins and fats, sure. Proteins of the indicated kind, not plant proteins. And fat of the indicated kind, not plant fats, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and plant monounsaturated fatty acids. The primary form of fat within ruminant meat is monounsaturated, then followed very closely by saturated. Animal monounsaturated and saturated fats indicated. Straight hydrocarbon chains with respect to saturated fats of the carbs. So for example, if you're used to having in the morning um, a slice of toast with some jam on it and an orange juice. Okay, all sugar. Right there was all sugar and plant anti-nutrients, so therefore toxin load, but not only that, complete destitution of actual bioavailable nutrition that is of utility by the human body. There's no protein contained within that that is of any utility and that is actually innocuous and doesn't damage the tissues. And there's no fat to speak of basically 100% carbs. That's gonna to lead to a lot of glucose and it's gonna make your diabetes or your insulin resistance worse. Not insulin resistance, covered that. Alternative is to have something like a hot tea and some soft- Don't drink tea. <laughs> Oxalates. And some soft boiled eggs with a little- There you go, eggs. Sea salt on them. There you go. Or even a ham sandwich is gonna contain less carbs than all of- Okay, well get rid of the bread. There you go, now you got ham. Why are we eating the carbs in the first place? Or sugary stuff that I just mentioned. But have a look at the food classification master list in the description of this episode to get started. There's but no point. You can totally do something about your insulin resistance and your diabetes. It's not a life sentence. It's not something you're born with. It's something that you are impacting with the way that you're eating every day. Carbohydrates. If you're wondering about the science, there's a really interesting 2021 review that made it very clear that the best way to reverse type 2 diabetes Reverse is a cause and effect claim the study you're expounding upon cannot inform upon any causal relationship between any heart health outcome and disease process as it relates to any aspect of human nutrition over any given period of time throughout the entire time human nutrition science has existed actually. Can't do it. Not one bit. That is theology you're holding in your hand right there. We can infer everything that I've just said and I've done so utilizing actual hard science, that being bio chemistry and human physiology. Okay? You're holding theology in your hand. It didn't show very clearly anything about reversing anything because reverse is a cause and effect claim. There are no studies to inform upon causal relationships like that within that field because it's theology. Because you can't impose complete control on your subjects. It is theory generating. Attend your glucose curves is to avoid those glucose spikes. The study was called Efficacy and Safety of Low and Very Low Carbohydrate Diets for Type 2 Diabetes Remission. 
systematic review and meta-analysis of okay so meta-analysis once again yeah like it says it's a review of a bunch of other studies so it's an aggregation of a bunch of other studies great and unpublished randomized trial data well at least it doesn't say the word controlled in there but it still says randomized and typically no they're not randomized properly at all very poorly randomized and typically have appalling statistical power due to their sample size and even if they didn't and therefore could establish statistical significance just because something is statistically significant does not mean that it is actually practically significant in the real world okay and in this study they saw that diabetes remission was observed in over 57% of participants at six months. Fantastic. Association, not saying that people should eat glucose and not saying that people should not eat low carbohydrate diets, or really in reality, no carbohydrates at all. But what I'm saying is you don't base opinions off these studies here and off these reviews because it's theology. We have so much evidence. Also, that was a relative outcome statistic. What were the absolute ones? Because let me tell you something. Just a few months ago, it was four degrees outside here in Illinois. And the next day it was nine degrees. That's 125% increase in temperature. Yeah, but effectively, it's the same f***ing thing. What were the absolute outcome statistics here? That now even the American Diabetes Association started endorsing diets that lead to smaller glucose spikes. No, the American Diabetes Association only advocates for carbohydrates. They advocate for the very compound that diabetic patients and sufferers can't metabolize properly due to the overconsumption of them throughout their lives. It's listed in the recipes and in the most recent ADA video with their new leader of health or whatever the hell you call them. I don't care what their title is. Where they said to have a fourth of your plate consist of bread, pasta, potatoes, rice. Fill half the plate with non-starchy vegetables like leafy greens, green beans, broccoli, and then one quarter of the plate from lean protein and the remaining quarter section of your quality carbohydrate choice, such as starchy vegetables, rice, pasta, bread. It's ridiculous. Really? helpful way to put your diabetes into remission. No, the helpful way is to omit the f***ing carbs, Jesse. This is just a bunch of pussyfooting around the issue in order to be anodyne core option. It's the most important thing to try to update how you're eating to get those glucose levels and insulin levels down. So let's go over my glucose hacks that are going to help you get there in a really easy way. Let's go over mine. I don't need it. Before we start, I just want to show you something. So over the past few years, I've been synthesizing all the latest. This entire video was called Simple Hacks to Reverse It Now. And we're 19 and a half minutes into the video and she hasn't even started yet. This is amazing. And it's a 25 minute video data into these 10 core principles that help get those glucose levels down and helps you put your diabetes or insulin resistance into remission. And in my second book, The Glucose Goddess Method, what I did is that I- What are all those foods on there? There's no meat whatsoever on there. There are no animal products listed here, depicted here. All of that is contraindicated nonsense. It isn't food for human beings. It's plant-based slop. 3,000 people uh, to follow my hacks for four weeks and I measured the impact. And just to show you something, so I asked them how it was going and I got a lot of data from them. There were a lot of people who joined who had type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance. And in these four weeks, by just adding four really simple tips, four really simple hacks, 41% of people saw an improvement in their diabetes. Okay, not to be overly critical, but that's not even half. That's not even half. Also, the Harvard study that came out just a few years ago that put people on carnivore diets, or at least told them to abide by it, showed pretty sure 100% of them, 100% of the participants came off of their insulin, and far more than 50% of them actually showed amelioration in diabetes. So that's even better. And the integrity of that study is just as of integrity as the one that you just cited there, your measurements, if not more. So you can ameliorate diabetes to a certain degree and tail it with your methods. I'm not pretending like you can't. That would be irresponsible of me, but it's not the most auspicious method and it's not the most salubrious one either because of the fact that you also encourage people to blunt their glucose spikes by eating the same amount of glucose, but also just adding in fiber and eating it first. Fiber is abrasive to the enteric nervous system. It causes more damage and they're still incurring damage from the glucose because it still elevates their glucose. Yes, a spike does more damage. I'm not pretending like that's not the case, but the easiest way is to get rid of the fiber and the glucose because you're engaging in a double whammy if you eat both of them and these hacks are incredibly easy we're talking about have a savory breakfast instead of a sweet one cut the carbs and vinegar once a day before a meal no this is obfuscation and pseudo sophistication this is gratuitous this is superfluous okay vinegar is not good for your teeth by the way 
add a veggie starter. No, vegetables contain toxins, lectins, oxalates, phytates, tannins, polyphenols, fiber, saponins, goitrogens, isothiocyanates, glucosinolates, glycoalkaloids. I can keep going. Your meals, lunch or dinner and go for a 10 minute walk after one meal a day. Okay, once again, superfluous. You can do it if you want. It's not a bad habit, but it's not needed if you don't eat carbs. Sorry. We're not talking about intense calorie counting. I'm not- Well, you can't even consume calories in the first place. You can't count calories because it's also a vast estimate. People don't eat calories. The human body doesn't absorb photons of light. About super hardcore diets that you're never gonna be able to follow. We need to find solutions that are easy, that integrate into your life, that allow you to still eat the carbs that you like. No, carbs are contraindicate. So this is just a very obvious justification for addiction. Right in front of our eyes, right here. Amazing. Carbohydrates are quite literally, and when I say literally, I mean it. It has weight behind it when I say the word literally. Literally a drug. They're unnecessary, cause damage, and they're addicting. They lead to pernicious, insidious death. Okay? And also, have you noticed that all drugs pretty much come from plants? Cocaine, heroin from poppy seeds, cocaine from a leaf, marijuana from cannabis plants, nicotine, caffeine, carbohydrates. I still eat those starches and sugars with- Oh, you can do whatever you want. Should you? No, not indicated. Cover that. Impact on your glucose levels. No, it's going to have an impact. It will have an impact, Jesse. So in the description of this episode, you can click and download a free one page PDF summary of my 10 core glucose hacks. Okay, you know what the best one is? You know what the only one that you need is? The one that says to not f eat it. I'm gonna help you get started putting your type 2 diabetes into remission or your insulin resistance into remission. I really wanna leave you with this key piece of information. Insulin resistance isn't a pathology in any manifestation. These conditions are not genetic or something you're born with or something that you can't do anything about. You said that. You have control, you have agency. It doesn't have to be too complicated. I know that change- it Doesn't have to be complicated at all, I covered it. It feels overwhelming, but these 10 hacks, have a look at them. I think you're gonna find them simple and life-changing. And if you want even more help to get started, I have lots of stuff- If you want more help, watch my channel, binge it. In fact, subscribe, buy my book, Contraindicated, as well. That'll give you everything that you need to know about it. I have my two books, Glucose Revolution- No, buy mine. Mine will be on the screen here, right now. Buy mine. The glucose goddess method with lots of recipes in the glucose goddess method i have my recipe club that gives you motivation and super simple recipes every single month look at this look at these foods here what the hell is this toxic slop to keep your glucose level steady and on top of all of this i have thousands and thousands of readers and people in the community who have successfully put their type 2 diabetes into remission using my hacks and I'm gonna read you a few of their testimonials, actually. Why? So these are community testimonials. This video was called, You Can Beat Diabetes and Insulin Resistance, Simple Hacks to Reverse It Now. There's no hacks, it was a plug. Whoever titled this video should be ashamed of themselves and should rename it so that it doesn't mislead people into thinking that they're gonna talk about something that they're not going to. I wasted my time here today thinking that I was gonna hear her hacks and I didn't hear any. We're done with this, we're absolutely done. Jesse, you're a biochemist, you should know the basic fundamental rudimentary knowledge, like the fact that glucose exogenously is unnecessary for the human body. Gluconeogenesis, it is not distressful on the body, it is not any more stressful on the body than the pancreas secreting enzymes for digestion, secreting insulin from the beta cells, secreting glucagon from the alpha cells. It is not any more stressful than any other process of the body performing its processes. The solution here is simple. Stop eating carbohydrates. Transition appropriately and prudently to a 100% carnivorous diet consisting primarily of the flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals. Grass-fed if you please. Do not listen to the zealots that say that you need grass-fed. Grain-fed is totally fine and it's what I subsist off of entirely. Eggs are fine as well. Pasture-raised preferably. Butter is fine. Saturated fat in the forms of butter tell a large suet and ghee. Once again, water, added salt to taste. Those are fine. 10% of your carnivorous diet is the maximum amount that I think that your diet can consist of any other meat besides ruminant meat, like fish, pork, and chicken. Be careful with those because of their fat content, the type of fat primarily. Dairy is fine if you tolerate it well. Avoid the ones with lactose in them because lactose is a sugar. Dairy is still quite inflammatory and addictive because it has beta casomorphin in it, or really it has casein in it, which can break down into beta casomorphin and does break down into it, which can be 
be a problem for people, especially ones that are recovering from food addiction. Okay, transition appropriately over the course of six to eight weeks. There you go. Diabetes is a sugar consumption problem, not an insulin resistance problem. Insulin resistance is a symptom. We're done here. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, please subscribe to the channel, and please comment your thoughts below. And by my book, Contra Indicated, please link below out now. Also, if you're looking to further ameliorate any inflammation that you may be plagued with, and you've already adopted a carnivorous diet bereft of carbohydrates and bereft of any plant material to speak of, I would suggest referring to the link on the bottom of the screen now, the Cerule link. And of course, before referring to that link, I would first refer you to the video in the top right corner of the screen or link to the description below, depending on whether YouTube wants to show it in the top right of the screen, called Cerule Products. Please go ahead and do that and email me further about the products if you're wanting to know how to get those products for free, because I'm sure that many of you would like to get those products for free. Of course, who wouldn't? Follow me on Instagram as well as X, formerly known as Twitter. I'm uploading my YouTube videos on that platform in order to hedge against any possible banning that I may actually have the privilege of experiencing on this platform the more I grow. Also, email me once again at edgoki14 at gmail.com if you have any questions. And with that being said, join me next time when we react to someone, no matter how good intentioned they may be, and put them right where they're wrong, which happens to be, in many cases, absolutely everywhere. So, see you then.